Welcome back to Block TV. It's time for Crypto Globe, where we take a trip around the world to hear about the latest developments in the industry. Now, to guide us on this tour, of course, is Ethan Pierce, director of the Paris-based Crypto Assets Institute. Ethan, thank you so much for joining us here today. Now, let's go through those top headlines that you love. Crypto exchange from Fcoin expects a default on $125 million of users' Bitcoin. What's the story here? Yeah, so um, yeah, it's around seven, between 7,000 and 13,000 Bitcoin. There's not an exact number, but that, that hits about 100 million bucks pretty quick. So um, it's an interesting story. We'll see exactly what it looks like. So according to the, 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 the founder, the CEO, he says that the Fcoin hasn't been hacked, um, that this is an exit scam. It's just internal data uh, errors that have now um, accumulated to create a financial problem for the company. Uh, the idea is that, uh, so Fcoin was, a, for a while, there was the uh, highest trading volume exchange uh, for a very simple reason. Uh, you could get, so basically any transactions that you did on the exchange, all of your transaction fees refunded to you uh, in the Fcoin's token. So uh, that way, basically, you were, you, you were getting everything for free. Um, now, that uh, runs into a bunch of different problems depending on how you how you go about doing it. First of all, exchanges generally their business model is is based on those fees. So if you remove that, how exactly are you going to make money? And this is where uh, Binance the CZ kind of came in uh, about a year and a half ago and and was not terribly uh, uh, positive on the subject of, of of how this was working for him. It was basically kind of like a fake ICO. Uh, so if you're charging people transaction fees in Bitcoin or Ethereum and then you're refunding those in the exchange's own token. Basically, you just did an ICO uh, and kind of, kind of swapping out the, those things. Uh, the issue, whether or not you know, that's necessarily a problem. The the end result, though, is, however, if if uh, if you're not making money off of transaction fees, then then where's your revenue? So the transaction fees themselves, uh, or the coins value rather itself, needs to become the the revenue stream. So it needs to become it needs to be more and more valuable, which basically creates a pyramid scheme problem. Um, whether or not there's any you know, bad uh, intentions on the part of this. Uh, uh, that's, you know, for the internet to, to rumor all they want to about. Uh, at, for this time, it, it's simply stating that it doesn't have funds to to follow through on, on, on all of its outstanding um, uh, Bitcoin uh, that it should be holding for people, but isn't. And so that's the, the issue. We'll see where that goes. Uh, in any case, the post from the founder is very, uh, uh, listen, you know, I, this, is, this is our, this is my debt. This is something we're going to assume and we're going to deal with. So, at least uh, uh, they're not disappearing like what's seen with a lot of these kind of things. The issue now is whether or not that that actually happens and can they actually find um, uh, uh, enough capital to be able to refund uh, all of these outstanding um, demands. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's take a shift over to a hopefully more successful platform. Uh, Fairmint launched their platform <laughs> that will let people invest in startup revenue. What's the story there? Yeah, this is pretty cool. So um, we're going to see lots of different ways to approach the whole idea of tokenized securities. I think uh, uh, we're depending on whether or not it's into real estate or it's an intellectual property or it's into um, the actual growth or, or opportunity of startups and existing companies. Lots of different models are going to come about. What Fairmint has done here that I think is pretty interesting is um, they're, they've created this thing called a continuous securities offering. And the idea is it looks an awful lot like a revenue share security token offering, except the idea being instead of uh, the potential token being tied to the future revenue, that's, you know, you're paid a dividend in some kind of a way. What they're saying is, is that you actually uh, take that revenue um, that you're going to share out, put it into some kind of um, a reserve that's held in escrow. And then the tokens themselves are uh, the value of the token is determined by an algorithm based on how much money is actually in the reserve at any given point in time, uh, as well as how much demand there is uh, for the liquidity of that token. So uh, it sounds it sounds pretty cool. I think uh, what's interesting, I think, in this story more than just another take on tokenized securities is that uh, this is a it's, a it's a decentralized finance approach. So you you know the tokens themselves are traded on Uniswap, a, a decentralized exchange. I think that that the one of the big questions around decentralization and the DeFi thing is how do we deal with regulated securities 
if we're going to be decentralized uh, in how we handle these things. And so, because this is uh, because Fairmint uh, is is in the U.S. and and they are you know they're the first one is for them, and they're running this in the U.S. Then they're obviously saying this is being run as a as a regulated security, so it's only open to U.S. Um, institutional investors, not open to to retail investors uh, at this time. Um, so you have to be accredited or an institutional investor. Uh, they're at least running it as a regulated sale, but the reality is, is the process itself of how the token um, is managed will be managed in a decentralized way. Um, I think this is going to be um, a healthy way to look at revenue share in, in, in companies. The biggest question I have is it really how Fairmint wants to do this. It's just on the general concept of revenue share into companies. Uh, it's, we have to be careful about using startups uh, as a word because startups uh, probably aren't making a lot of money. And in theory, most startups should be reinvesting their revenue into growth. Uh, now, they don't have to be doing hyper growth like the, the kind of silly unicorn kind of stuff we've seen where they are not, they're, they're trading growth for actual long-term stability and revenue. But in any case, early stage startups that are making smaller amounts of revenue and, and as they grow more and more into larger amounts of revenue, still need to be pushing most of that towards growth in order to obtain market you know, leadership and, and, and other issues. So I think in terms of startups, that's going to be the biggest question about you know, um, embracing uh, revenue share is to how much, how much can you actually share before you are starting to have a negative impact on your growth potential. Uh, and then also, I mean, when you're trying to run a revenue share uh, uh, for tokenized security as a startup, then are you are you already revenue positive or are you promising revenue in the future? Uh, that's kind of the big issue. So I think that this becomes really interesting when we're talking about companies that already have uh, enough revenue and enough stability to be able to show that those revenues are shareable through tokenization and then also that they can share some of that revenue without necessarily having a toxic effect on, on their growth uh, potential. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I think this is a really cool story. I think it's it's fun to see the this kind of movement in the tokenized security space. Um, whether or not we'll see retail adoption is the, is I think one of the biggest questions around anything with tokenized securities. But in any case, this is a a, a, a nice new way to be able to invest in the future of, of cool companies. Mm -hmm. Well, if we're talking about tokenized securities, uh, we have to mention that Flight uh, actually has launched Africa's first property-backed security token. Uh, how, what's your views on that? Yeah, this is interesting. So um, Flight is a, a hospitality fund based in uh, South Africa. What they do is um, uh, they invest in the hospitality and, and apartment hotels in Cape Town. Uh, they're using something called Section 12J um, uh, of the South African, um, let's see, what's, what's it called here? The, the Income Tax Act from 2009. And uh, what that allows you to do is when you invest into a fund that is covered under this Section 12J, then you're able to get 100% of that investment uh, back as a tax deduction. So this has been something that's, that's created about $400 million uh, of investment into South Africa since 2009. Um, I think that's a, so what they've done basically is take that existing fund and they are working with uh, Swiss company um, Bakari to uh, tokenize that and this will allow people to invest in a non-tokenized normal way into the fund to continue what they've been doing, or to be able to do that uh, through the uh, Ethereum, the ERC-20 uh, token that they have put into place. And what that'll allow people to do is to basically uh, buy into the fund and manage that uh, in, a, in a more liquid way, uh, or to also be able to still uh, do that in the traditional way. So before it required about $66,000 as a minimum of investment into uh, this fund now uh, on the tokenized side, the minimum investment will, will be able to be $3,300. Uh, and so that, you know, is creating a much more easy access into sharing the, the opportunities of this real, real estate investment fund. Um, I think it's fairly interesting. The, uh, what I love about these stories is just the simple fact that we are finding more and more people who are already in uh, their respective spaces, whether it's uh, property uh, in terms of real estate, whether it's other things around intellectual property for patents and music and film, uh, uh, all kinds of stuff that are, it's the same investors that are just potentially finding new ways, more um, um, potentially efficient ways to deal with uh, the investments that they're already making. So this could obviously, because of the lower entry point and, and other things, this could provide uh, ways for retail investors or others to get into uh, this fund. 
Um, but in a lot of ways, it's simply going to be a more efficient way for people to uh, move uh, money in and out of existing investment vehicles like this. So um, it's the first uh, tokenized real estate uh, uh, activity, I believe, in Africa, if I understood right from the press release. So uh, good sign that these these ideas are, are starting to go pretty much everywhere, that regulation is caught up and that uh, uh, existing historical companies are, are, are jumping in. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, a change of pace from the ERC-20 based tokenized securities. Uh, now a German bank is offering tokenized securities based off Stellar. What, what kind of changes uh, practically does that mean for the investor? Yeah, so this, this, is, so this actually continues that theme of uh, basically taking what is already being done on the existing, uh, with existing investors and just creating a more efficient way to, uh, to work with investments. So we discussed at the end of 2019 uh, the, this amendment to the, the German Banking Act that was going to allow German banks to buy, sell, and store digital assets on behalf of third parties. So that was going to take place on January 1st uh, of this year uh, being put into effect. We now have one of the first results of that change with um, uh, Bank uh, von der Heidt, which is uh, they were founded in 1754, so it's one of the oldest private banks in Europe. And in partnership with Bitbond, they have announced that they are going to be uh, offering um, tokenized digital securities uh, to their institutional clients uh, via these private uh, placements. So this will allow them to kind of make a lot of the existing uh, assets that they're offering um, liquid or more efficient to work with uh, by trading kind of directly with those and cutting out some of the intermediaries uh, should you know make things more efficient but also potentially cheaper uh, in terms of fees and other issues so uh i always think it's again interesting when you see something that's you know this is a a, a, a 300 year old bank uh, well 250 year old bank that's um um getting into all right well ethan uh the, that was yep. uh you cut off over there um but perfect timing as well that's all the time we have here for today. Thank you so much for joining us and taking us around the globe. Boy, was that fun. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ethan. For all our viewers at home, if you want more on tech news, blockchain, and crypto, make sure to check us out at blogtv.com. For more news and updates, follow us on Twitter.